The uh, delegate from the 99th District, Wayne Clark. Wayne, good morning. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Look what you get to follow up. <laughs> Excited to follow up on that uh, earlier session. Yes. You're going to come off well no matter what after a segment <laughs> like that, brother. Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, let, let's talk about the uh, obviously the most recently concluded uh, um, session here. And I know in, in April you guys go back for uh, another shorter session here. You are the Vice Chair of Economic Development and Tourism. Let's talk about that first and some specific bills that you are happy to be a part of and, and get across this session. So, um one uh, great um, uh, uh, reward for me, I guess, to uh, be asked to sit on economic development and tourism uh, as a vice chair. Um, you know, this session uh, I was extremely busy. I had 19 bills that I co-sponsored or sponsored. It became law um, in regards to economic development and tourism. Um, we uh, we had a few really good bills go through uh, in regards to the uh, Northern Ohio Trail, um, working on the Elk Trail. Um, the hold on, I'm going to try to get it right. The Cabway Lingo um, State Park and Trail as well. Um, we had um, I'm looking down on my notes. The uh, Senate Bill 591, which um, allows the uh, counties and municipalities to work jointly, their economic development teams to work jointly, um, providing each one has a stake in the game, uh, you know, $15,000, but then they can apply together. Uh, a lot of times, if you go back to, say, 2010, 12, 14, when uh, the outside area of Charlestown over where the Home Depot is, uh, a lot of companies wouldn't come in because the Ranson residence wasn't big enough. Well, they wouldn't go to Charlestown because the Charlestown resident wasn't big enough. But if you put them together, they met their their uh, quota for, for, for foot traffic. Mm -hmm. So this will, this will give those, um, those areas throughout the state the opportunity to put their stuff together you know, they're they're um, one their money, but also their uh, their residents population uh, population to attract, you know, the businesses that come to the area. So um, I was really happy to see that one get through. Very nice. Uh, in regards to some of the major stuff, Wayne, the tax cut uh, was this something that you voted for enthusiastically, or was a I will hold my nose and vote for it? Because we need to get something passed. I stood on my head on the floor and voted with the top of my head. I was so excited about it. Excellent. Tell me why. Well, I mean, come on. We've had surplus, 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 surplus. And it was time for us to give back to um, to the taxpayers directly. You know, we've been, um, you know, doing a lot of economic development uh, through Mitch Carmichael's office um, of bringing in new jobs and new businesses to the to the state, which is going to all, all that's going to do is just add uh, to our revenue down the road once they're open and they're they're efficient and running. Um, but to be able to give them back, um, you know, that kind of a tax break um, uh, this year w was. Tremendous. I mean, I was 100% supportive of Eric Householder's uh, tax plan that he presented in 2021, you know, 10%, 10%, 10% over the next three years, and then have a, uh, um, a, a fund set up. And then once that fund hit, um, I think we had it at $400 million, then we would buy down the uh, tax rate again and buy another 10, which it kind of essentially is what we came up with, um, with the additions of the vehicle and the uh, mm -hmm. uh equipment um rebates so, so each 10 percent is about 230 million or something to that ish. effect wayne yeah right. yeah but on the first day of the session the house approved a 50 percent 50 percent uh tax uh decrease and that was 1.4 billion and we ended up with what, 21 and change uh, for 700 million dollar savings is there some disappointment that there's your your the citizen's wallet is Seven hundred million dollars lighter than it otherwise would have been. You know, yes, but at the same time, we also knew that we had to uh, attack PEIA. We had to do something. Um, you know, we, we if we would have continued down the road we were on, which was you know just funding the back end of it to make it you know balance the zero, 
uh, we were looking at a $400 million hit by 2027, you know, of taxpayer money to backfill PEIA. So um, when you take the $1.4 billion uh, tax plan that we uh, passed through the House, which was the same one that the governor wanted, um, that he spoke about in his state of state, um, when you take that and then you add in the PIA, well, we're already over our our surplus, you know, of of you know one point. I think we're going to finish at one point seven, one point eight, eight billion, uh, because the coal severance tax is coming down a little bit. Mm-hmm. <coughs> so, you know, it could have been harder um, to swallow the the fifty percent. Uh, the good news is with this one, there's triggers um, to you know reduce by ten percent uh, as we get more money coming in. So um, I'm I'm happy with what we got through, and, and I think with that and the PEIA uh, and the uh, the twenty three hundred dollar raises uh, across the board to help offset the PEIA uh, premiums that as they're changing and they're going into effect, um, I th- I think we uh, hit everything the best we could. Oh, yeah. Sort of a shift in subject. One of the things that I've, I've been wanting to ask our, our delegates and senators on the very first day of the legislative session, I believe it was 3,000 bills mm-hmm. that were introduced, which is a lot. Yeah. Um, that's too many to actually, for me to read over the course of a 60-day session, right? So what is that next step? First of all, two, several questions. Of the 3,000, what percentage were total surprises to the members you say, to you, for example. I, well, so we had 3,000 in the House that were introduced on the first day. Uh, we ended up getting up to, I think the last bill number I saw was 35, like 80. So we got around 3,500 bills. Right. Senate got somewhere around, uh, I think the biggest one I saw in Senate was 790. So you're talking 4,500 bills, right? Okay. Okay. We passed 323. Now, Did I, you look at forty five hundred? No. Okay. No, you can't. Right. And and and, and I and, and as I I told all the freshmen, um, we actually had a, a my, my freshman year we actually had a delegate um, who read every one. Oh my! Wow. <laughs> and I'm like, just you know, and I was lucky because I had John Hardy and Jason Barrett in my office, you know, and they're like, read stuff that you think, um, you know, looking at the title that interests you read things that you know are going to come through your committees so you're prepared but make sure that you read it before it gets on the floor so you know where you're voting because if you try and read every single one uh, you, you can plus be... you don't really need to read a bill until it gets through committee anyway do you correct I mean, correct what's the sense of reading a bill that has no chance of being lawed if it doesn't get through its committee well, if you're on the no committee chance. you want to read that but... that one yeah right. but but you know, on every committee, I mean, some of the committees are busier than others, but there's yeah. no particular committee that would make you need to read all 4,500 bills unless they get through the other committee to be considered on the floor, right? Correct. Right. And a 60-day session doesn't allow for a lot of um, investigative, what do they call it, committee? Uh, the expert testimony. Expert, yes, thank you. Expert testimony, testimony to come in and, and vet a bill. So is is that done in the... Off season, that's some- majority. Of your interims are are presentations. Uh, you have you have two things that happen. So, um, as an example, uh, in in economic development, we had a a, a a a series of tax incentives that we were offering um, on uh, businesses that one, we're not collecting the tax now because we don't have a business in the state that that does that. Uh, Example, um, uh, uh, heavy truck manufacturers, you know, these big, you know, tractor trailer Mac, Mac trucks, okay? So we don't have a manufacturer in the state that does that. <clears throat> there are federal um, tax incentives for, for making those. Well, we propose a, a series of bills that would give them state tax if they came in for a period of time and open up a factory and started making them here. 
uh, many of them didn't make it through. So now we're going to convert those into uh, study resolutions. So during the interim session, we're going to look at those and try and figure out, okay, what didn't we have set up correctly in the bill to get it to pass? Uh, what did we miss or what, what do we need to, to look at to make sure that we have a strong bill coming in next session that we can introduce on day one and move that through the process? So that's how a lot of your interim studies go, um, and that's, you know, that's where your presentations are. That's where your testimonies are. Now, in regards to committee itself, um, you have a bill, and whatever the bill is about, you know, uh, we want to, you know, paint all the streets red. So we're going to have someone from Department of Highways is going to show up. We're going to have someone from whatever painting company is going to show up, and they're going to tell us why we should pass it or why we shouldn't pass it. So, um, but those are very limited um, in time. You might go to your committee and you might have 16 bills on your on your roster for that day on your agenda and it's like okay we got to get through these 16 bills in an hour or two hours you know you don't have a lot of time for questions you know some bills you know we you know we've had we've had marathon sessions in the education committee where we've actually uh you know talked about a bill for 12 hours six on one day six on another day you know so some of them get a little more attention than others you know it just happens Paul Espinosa just sent me a text. The uh, House Speaker Pro Tem said 2,317 bills introduced, 333 completed legislative action. That's right. I'm sorry. That. Yeah, because we started with bill number 2,000 this year. Yeah. yeah. So, about so legislative action does not necessarily mean passed, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 14%. At least that's not how they're listed. Um, uh, Wayne, let's talk about uh, a bill you worked on uh, in your first term. I think it was called Megan's Megan's Law. Law, right? Yep. And and was that actually implemented during this school year? Um, we finalized all of the training uh, and the um, uh, the the training manual, everything uh, in December. So um, all of your um, your nurses and your counselors all went through that training during December January time frame um, and it's now listed on the um, uh, 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 what's it called when the teachers come in the, for their the, the, the course syllabus um, before school starts their their required training right. so it's it's listed there so all all teachers will have to pass that will go through that uh, this August and then um, they'll have a re refresher uh, every three years, mm -hmm. and all new teachers, um, at, when they're hired, will go through it as and well. And what's the focus of Megan's Law? So Megan's Law helps to identify um, kids that are um, suffering from, you know, self-harm processes where they're cutting themselves um, from depression or bullying or whatever, um, and also identifies, helps um, teachers identify kids that are suffering from an eating disorder. So with uh, with everything that we've been going through uh, since the pandemic, this, is, this, pro this has multiplied in, um, you know, it's a constant uh, battle with, with our kids. Um, there, you know, there was a a segment on Fox News last night and they were talking about how you know kids are learning you know they're learning everything online on their phone and there was a uh, a, a situation where where a girl learned how to make a you know something for dinner a recipe and as soon as she was done reading through the recipe an ad came on about pro Anna teaching her about how to purge her food you know and this is you know, right right after learning how to make something, it's like, okay, here's how to purge it. You know, so, and uh, kids are very influenced by what they see uh, on, on online. And, you know, this is going to give our teachers opportunities to help uh, identify kids that are struggling that you might not even know. From a, from a greater perspective on this, Wayne, is that Congress's responsibility to get these media companies to make sure that these ads don't show up in front of minors? Is that something the state can control? I've had a bill for the last two years um, that uh, relates to Child Online Privacy Protection Act 
um, whereas the federal uh, law states that um, internet companies cannot market or or sell uh, information or gather information from kids that they know are under 13. Um, and I, my law would would move the state of West Virginia from 13 to 18. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that uh, there's been there's been a weak push through Congress to change the COPA law federally, but like I said, it's been a weak push. It's not. Uh, they'll we'll, we'll talk about it, but no one will actually do it. I think future historians are going to look back and they're going to blame social media for 88% of, of the ills of society. Now it just, there's, it's so pernicious and it never goes away, especially among these, these kids with the bullying that is not only nonstop, but you, know, you can't get away from it. When, I guess I, I was bullied finger quotes when I was a kid, but I go home and then, then it would go away. Now, these days it just lives on and on and on and, and, and binging and purging and all this. It's, there's got to be a way to get the genie back into the bottle, or maybe not. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I you know, I hope that you know, um, you know, next year I'm going to reintroduce my bill again, you know, and I'm going to keep reintroducing the bill. And, and why does it die? Why doesn't get? Why does it not get traction? I think people are are afraid of it. Uh, I did uh, a, a speech um, last year on the floor um, during our member comments about it um, because it's – so the basics of it is uh, instead of buying the phone, instead of me buying the cell phone in my name and giving it to my child and buying all these backdoor um, monitoring systems and everything that the kid can just turn off, um, I buy the phone in my child's name. So now the <clears throat> phone is registered in my child who's under the age of 18. The Internet companies, uh, before they give access to the child, uh, have to get written permission from me that I allow them to have Instagram or, or Snapchat or whatever or TikTok or whatever. And if I say no, they can't send it to the phone because it has its unique IP address. Um, they already have to do this if the child's 13 or under. But because we buy the phone and we put it in our name, they don't know that the child's 13 or 12 that has the phone. So they just download it and then they go on. Um, the, the state of West Virginia already has a cellular geofence. Um, folks who uh, bet online, you know, through DraftKings or whatever, mm-hmm. there's a there's a geofence around the state, and if you ever go on, you know, to DraftKings and you're like real close to the state of Maryland, mm-hmm. it'll, it'll say, "Please turn on your location so that we know where you're at." Um, and uh, you know, um, I went down to Harper's Ferry, and I, you know, it's like, okay, I'm right close to the line. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so the, all the technology is there. Uh, and the internet companies are already doing it. Um, why they don't want to? Why they don't want to do it? Well, because they know that, you know, you're going to have situations where, where you know, these big companies that are paying a lot of money to advertise, you know, because they're advertising to to the kids, um, they're going to they're going to lose advertising money, you know. And you think that's the source of the pushback within the state house? Absolutely. You know, it's it's a scary bill. You know. I mean, you know, we would be the first uh, to have this law, you know, and but I guarantee you if we ever did pass it, um, we'd be the first for only a few weeks because everybody else will start adopting it. See, this is the kind of thing that screams for a public hearing. Absolutely. And expert testimony and just just hammer it. Uh, it, Well, it's. I, I, it's hard to think of a legitimate pushback on a bill like that from my point of view. Mm-hmm. You would think, yeah, you know, um, and like I said, it's something that's that they already do. So we're not asking them to do anything more than they already do. Wayne Clark is our guest delegate out of the 99th. 
Uh, final minute or so here, Wayne, uh, the prosecuting attorney from your county, Matt Harvey, mm-hmm. uh, consulted some people about uh, some uh, negligent homicide bills that uh, he's been trying to get passed. Can you tell me what the status of those were? And uh, if you need any further descriptions on that, uh, I'll give you one example. Somebody passes a school bus, hits a kid, uh, kills the kid. They might do six months or a year uh, in prison for that while the kid's dead. Uh, it seems like the penalties for that should be uh, a lot stronger than they are, and he's been frustrated by his lack of success in getting that law strengthened. Well, I can tell you I do know that, uh, um, and that's a prime, prime go go back to our, our our first start. How many bills do you read? What do you read? You know, um, so I'm not on judiciary, so I don't, you know, you don't know a whole lot I don't spend that. a lot on that. So I encourage you to give Matt a call one day and just kind of discuss that one. Matt was in my office early in the session. Um, You know, I know we did pass the uh, um, if if you're in a DUI, if you you, if you're driving under the influence and and you uh, cause the death of a mother and a mother is uh, carrying an unborn child, um, the unborn child is also so it's it's two two. So, um, but I I know that. Matt has been pushing for that bill. Um, I did it make any progress this year. Do you know? I don't recall seeing it on the floor. Okay. Of the House, I don't know if it made it through the Senate and it died in judiciary or it didn't. You know. <coughs> you know. It's. Uh, I know. I was talking to Moore Capito and he said they had like seven hundred and fifty bills that they, you know, went through in, in judiciary. I mean, that's that's a lot. Put a yellow highlighter on this one from Matt Harvey. It seems important. Yes. Uh, Wayne, any final thoughts from you? Anything you want the uh, folks in your legislative district to know about this last session? I, I, I think the overall the, um, the legislature uh, listened, uh, made a, a conscious effort to, to do what uh, folks have been wanting to see us do, um, which is, you know, one, passing the big um, – you know, tax deduction, you know, and that's going to have triggers that continue on. Uh, I want to thank everybody in the Eastern Panhandle for for voting in just absolutely incredible people. You know, Mike Height, Mike Hornby um, just absolutely, you know, came in and just went right to work. Um, <coughs> really good uh, folks, you know, Delegate Ryan Nauer out of the uh, out of the hundredth, you know, came in with a very strong passion. Um, you know, did a lot of good, uh, you know, communication with everybody. So, you know, everybody as a whole, as a team, worked really, really well this session.